I firstly want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Walulup, which is otherwise known as Fremantle, and that these are the unceded lands of the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation. And I'd like to acknowledge that the traditional custodians of these lands from the past, present and future. Um, and what I'm trying to do today is build on some ideas that we started to sketch out in the first chapter of this book up here. Um, what's the book called? Digital Intimate Publics and Social Media on the screen now. And so in the first chapter of that, I sketch uh, some ideas out about the underlying potentially queer politics of digital intimate publics. So I unpack how the social and cultural meaning of intimacy is currently being contested and struggled over in some important ways via debates about social media use and particularly the judgment of oversharing. Um, so to really briefly, and when I say briefly, I mean in one sentence, summarise um, my framing here and the kind of the key take home from me in looking to, um, you know, queer theory, queer cultural theory and sexuality studies, it's that it shows us how intimacy is very much a socially sanctioned and defined thing. It's not, you know, it's not obvious, it's not uncontested. And as Sarah Cafe and Nick Cauldry put it, quote, heteronormativity shapes, and I would add importantly, colonialism and patriarchal white supremacy is really what we're talking about too, shapes what can appear to us as intimate, even in settings where questions of sexual identity are typically not articulated as such. Social media platforms are so interesting, I think, because um, as Hjorf and Arnold argue, they constitute a new socio-technical institutionalization of public intimacy. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna basically frame this by reading what I think are the kind of key or important bits of the abstract for this talk, and then go on to discuss some, to work through some visual examples. So, and what I've said there is that participation in social media, communication and self-representation has become near imperative for many people, especially for young people. And of course, this was so before the global lockdowns began and is certainly more so now. And um, I do think there's increasing public awareness of and concern about the design features, the app interfaces and the platform algorithms that are aimed at in short, keeping users engaged and active for as long as possible and generating effective responses, right? So we do have increasing awareness of and discussion about that. But it's still, I don't think, being picked up in the ways I'd like it to be picked up in public discourses and education discourses about social media participation, which are still framed very much in terms, of, as Jessica and Caitlin have just been talking about, of human agency and the individual choices and responsibilities of users. Um, and I want to suggest along kind of gendered, race and class lines. So in thinking about what is important in conceptualising intimacy in, the, in a post-digital world, um, I'm, I'm going to try and highlight the need to understand social media participation and self-representation beyond simplistic notions of human agency and choice. And I guess what I'm trying to do here is kind of apply or consider a, a reparative reading following Eve Sedgwick and Robin Reedman of social media participation that I think is ethically mandated in this context, right, of, of such, um, you know, not really, not really optional use for so many people. Um, and particularly is mandated, I think, when we're talking about more provocative and contentious types of images and self-representation um, that I would that are sort of framed often as or contested around this term oversharing, right? So next slide, please. So the examples that I want to discuss are not about youth and sexting. Um, rather, I'm talking through three, because I've just added one more example, which are to do with women and childbirth images. And this isn't no coincidence, I think, because we can see some very strongly contested debates about 
oversharing and intimacy in the digital age around um, this particular, around childbirth and, and parenting online. Um, so this image that's up here was taken in 2015. It's a selfie taken by Gil Solano. Some of you might, have, might remember or have seen this before, or at least seen me talk about it before. <laughs> um, and he took it, when he took it at the bedside of his wife in labour, it went viral. Um, and after this image went viral, it was reported on in media around the world, in the New York Daily News, in the Huffington Post, in the ABC, and elsewhere around the world. And I kind of looked at some of the reports thing to see what these articles, which are all pretty short, were talking about. And, you know, yeah, they're, they're pretty short. They're just image-focused reports, but they do raise questions basically centred on the ethics of this and whether or not his wife was okay with this image, did she give her consent to this image being taken and then shared globally? But what I want to suggest in, in brief here is that I don't think this image was circulated around the world in global and discussed in global media just because we're concerned about the well-being of Sarah Solano or because we're concerned more broadly about the treatment of women in post-digital intimate worlds. Um, rather, I'd suggest that it, this kind of disturbed our cultural sensibilities around intimacy and it provoked then questions about not just ethics but also about taste, right, as is often the case, I think, in discourses about intimacy in public and what constitutes sharing versus what constitutes oversharing. Uh, so next slide, please. And I should have put sort of a language and an image, you know, maybe at least a language because I am going to get, get rough in a minute. Um, so this is another, another kind of imagery I'd like to think about then is, is women choosing to share intimate body birth and labour pictures because this also happens regularly. Um, and, you know, baby crowning shots essentially are, are a thing. Um, and the image that I'm using here was taken by a birth photography company, Apple Blossom Families, and shared on a popular sort of women's, um, women's media site in an article about intense birth photos, right? Um, but this has come up in my own feeds. I've seen, and recently a friend, um, after giving birth, has, has sent a poll around Instagram asking to her followers, do they want to see the crowning video of her birth? And we await the results of that poll. And as I await the results of that poll, having already seen the, the video myself, like what I think is, and I'm, I'm purely speculating and adding this, this example in at the last minute, right? But she, I think she's undoubtedly going to garner some very concerned responses that if not directed to her face to, you know, directly, will be raised in conversations about what choices she's making here and what, you know, why is she making these particular choices or why is she asking? And I think, you know, even just that possibility of sharing publicly crowning baby shots or videos pushes at the boundaries of white middle-class accepted public intimacies and privacy and taste. So that's what I'd say about that one. Um, the, the next image I want to think through, and I'll come back to most of these. Can I have the next slide, please? Is of featuring Constance Hall, who's a very well-known um, social media celebrity in Australia. I don't know if she's very well-known in Europe, but she's from Perth. So shout out to Perth. Um, and she's published two books about on her philosophy of shamelessness, and motherhood and queendom. She talks a lot about all women being queens and all women deserving respect. Uh, she briefly ran a podcast, The Queen Slash. She's launched a fashion brand called Queen the Label and she's appeared on Dancing with the Stars. <clears throat> now, basically, look, in short, there's a lot of holes we could pick in her proclamations about queenhood for all women, right? So there's some very problematic discourses happening in Constance's writings. Um, but in short, 
you know, to, to be understood in and to be reparatively read, they, they her discourses about queendom for all women really need to be understood in, in relation to her own proximity to the abjected figures of the welfare-dependent single mother and welfare recipient family and friends that shape Constance's background and relationships, right? So she is not from a privileged background. Um, and she is often abused and put down in very class terms along the lines of comments like, she looks like a walking venereal disease that needs to invest in a bra. So um, Mia, when she was interviewed, Mia Friedman interviewed her and, and put it this way, you know, Australians seem to either love or hate Constance. They can't decide if she's a truth-telling goddess or a loud, smelly bogan. And for those of you that don't understand the term bogan, it's kind of the Australian way of saying white trash, right? Um, so after the birth of her fifth child, Raja, here at the end of the bed in May 2018, she posted this image on her platform, on her various feeds, and this generated predictably some extreme criticism and abuse in very sexist and classist terms, particularly around her fitness as a mother. So Constance wrote, you know, I think she she wrote a, a a good follow, you know, a good response to the trolling and abuse received, which is on the next slide, please. And it was this. Um, yesterday I posted a picture of myself on the on my phone, um, on the phone the day my son was born. And of course it followed, it was followed by a few fuckers and their stuck up judgments about what I was doing on my phone. Uh, instead of spending my every second doting and being the eternally grateful goddess mother. The truth is it's nobody's business what a mother is doing on her phone the day she gives birth. If she's sending her children and mother photos of the baby or Googling tip jobs in Thailand, it's not your business. In fact, the way another mother is mothering is not your problem. Okay, and again, there's a lot that we could say about that post itself and, you know, um, <laughs> and Constance. But these images for me, I want to say, suggest kind of illustrate the notion that I began with, that heteronormativity shapes what can appear to us as intimate, even in settings where questions of sexual identity are typically not articulated as such. Again, that quote from Kafai and Cauldry. Put another way, patriarchal heteronormative cultural norms shape what and whose lives, experiences, bodies and relationships are questioned in terms of their appropriateness for a public context and whose lives, experiences, bodies and relationships go unremarked or appear to be less contested when publicly shared. So the questions I... Um, want to raise about what's happening are, are really just about, you know, what is happening here when the news media reports on such images and when people themselves kind of react and respond and debate the ethics and the taste involved in these kinds of image sharing practices. And, um, you know, in short, if, if it's not already obvious, I'd, I'd suggest that discourses about social media sharing and oversharing as they play out in public and in private conversations are not just about ethics and privacy, but about taste. And notions of taste, as we know, are heavily classed and, are of, and often the sort of serving to protect and reinforce the boundaries of class in westernised, colonised cultures. Um, I like this quote from feminist poet Susan Bradley Smith and scholar who, I, and so I put it here, she writes, taste is a middle class opiate that oppresses. So I think in short people's concerns about like there are important considerations here around ethics and privacy and but people's concerns about protecting others and notably here the concerns are around protecting white women and their children um, and sometimes protecting children from their own mothers. Um, and I think these are tied inextricably in our reasoning for these concerns to upholding notions of intimacy that are heteronormative um, 
classed, raced and gendered. And then these are actually foundational to the social structures and social fabric of patriarchal colonial societies where notions of private relations and private property go hand in hand as the Lant and Warner sort of point, pointed out strongly back in, in their um, work on this back in the 90s. Um, Next slide, please. So these images then also, I think, help us to think about notions of human agency, choices and intentionality in social media participation and to consider the role of non-consensual human actions, less than conscious human choices and the non-human technical affordances and infrastructures that all contribute to, notion, to the conditions of fast, wide virality, virality of people's shared images. So when Sarah Solano was interviewed back in when this image went viral by BuzzFeed, she was asked about all this and she said she did not know that the picture was being taken at the time, unsurprisingly. She, um, and quote, quote, I had been pushing for a few hours and Gil showed it to me to help take my mind off things and make me laugh. And I thought it was hilarious and I told him he should send it to some of our friends. The couple then got such positive responses that Gil then decided to post the image on Reddit. And it's unclear in the reports I could find about this if he asked his wife before doing this. Um, and it's since been viewed more than 2 million times. So then, you know, we might also ask some, some other interesting questions around this, like what if she had minded that the image was taken in that moment? Or what if, um, or that it went viral, as many of the articles ask about. But I guess more to my point, of, well, there's a couple of points I want to make here. First, I want to ask, following Michael Warner on publics and counterpublics, right, who is the readerly public being constituted here in articles about this image and around the notion that Sarah Solano, you know, that women giving birth might feel that this is this sort of this image, which is a kind of joyful, loving selfie taken by her husband documenting the moment of their labour, would or, or should likely be a source of public embarrassment or shame or invaded privacy. Um, so I think it's in relation to debates about oversharing and about intimacy in post-digital publics, I think it's really important for, for researchers, for educators and policymakers to think very carefully and critically about where the urges for, pro, towards protection and privacy come from um, and the social structures that play into this and what is it that, that is that we're seeking to protect and uphold when we judge something as too intimate for public platforms, right? But then I'd also like to go down a slightly different line of thinking about this image and Sarah Solano's response to it, to its virality, right? And this is a line of thinking that is more closely linked to my own past research and, and other people's work, like Jessica's who've been speaking around gender, youth and sexting. And that is, you know, we also need to question further, I think, um, um, next slide, please, the psychosocial investments in the response of Sarah Solano, right? Um, that this is all a bit amusing, that she doesn't really mind, she didn't really mind, it was kind of funny. And then we might ask, well, what else is, could she really say, like after the fact? Um, that is, once this image, which she didn't know was being taken, had gone, had been, been taken and then been shared and gone viral, then the notions of agency, choice, intention and who actually minds what are already pretty fuzzy, right? And her options of a livable experience are already significantly kind of narrowed, right? Um, doesn't it then become understandably the best, most livable option here for Sarah Solano to tell herself that the, and the media that she didn't mind the image was taken, she didn't mind that it went viral, 
rather than materially discursively constituting an injury or a violence in relation to this moment in her life and a moment that is so heavily culturally invested as intimate, as precious via heteronormative discourses. Um, and I note this because, you know, of course, there's a lot of different, I don't want to paper too, well, I'm going to paper over differences here and say that, like, similarly to many, to Sarah Solano, many young people, just like many adults, rationalise their experiences of non-consent and of breached ethical boundaries, potentially, um, after the fact, you know, and we do hear, um, as well as hearing girls talk about their concern, we also hear girls talk about them not being, you know, I'm not, I'm not too bothered by being called a slut. I'm not that bothered by being, by receiving dick pics, you know, and sometimes I'm not that bothered by really quite abusive or, or boundary breaching behaviours, right? Thus, it's, again, really important for us as researchers and thinkers not to simply take such responses at face value. Um, and that's why I love, you know, you, the work of the other speakers here to think more deeply about the complexity of people's agency within existing social structures and technical structures, right? And the options people have for materially discursively kind of making their lives livable in these situations. So I've gone down two kind of trails of thought about, about um, intimate image sharing and non-consensual intimate image sharing more broadly. But as I hope you can see, I don't think these different trails of thought are necessarily contradictory. Like I think we need to think about both of these things. And I guess my point is simply that we need to keep foregrounding notions of human agency in post-digital, in the post-digital era and conscious choice in relation to social media image sharing and participation as, as complicated, as not, you know, a straightforward matter. And then also, as I've been talking about, in publicly debating and discussing everyday social media image sharing practices and in discussing safety, cyber safety, protection, and sharing versus oversharing, researchers, educators, health professionals, media commentators and, and, you know, all of us, others, have a role to play, right, in either challenging or reinforcing heteropatriarchal cultural discourses and judgments about whose lives and experiences and relationships and emotions can be shared with publicly without much apparent contestation and whose cannot. So I've suggested here that often these kinds of debates are fueled by and anxiety around the slippage or erosion of middle class, you know, and heteropatriarchal colonial notions of property and proprietary following their gigs that have long structured the, that binary division between um, places and concepts of the public and the private. Thank you.